work constantly with your team members, your peers. So it means that all the work you're doing is constantly integrated in, in uh, central place in order to you get, uh, you get um, the result of uh, the work of everyone if it's still working when you get all together or you get the, the, all the work merged into a single place. So we have continuous delivery. That is something like, and a step further, it's like to provide your work constantly to reveal by the team and the client, or the client. So it means that you have a central place that you are doing continuous integration. I mean, you are putting your code with your peers in a uh, centralized place, and it's available for the other uh, peers, the colleagues, to review your code or review the feature, the functionality you are implementing, and also the client can be uh, able to see and check if this is going to deliver the value that he's expecting. So then we go, we go to continuous deployment. What the difference in, in between continuous delivery and continuous deployment is like a conceptual uh, difference because it's like deploy your work constantly right into client server. I mean, uh, when you are doing continuous delivery, it's not mandatory that you uh, put your code in, at, in production. So continuous deployment, it means that when you finish something, it goes right to production. So you have to make a process that prevents the, the most uh, possible errors in order to minimize the chance of getting something wrong in production because you, you're putting right to production. So let's see how can we do this. The main concept of uh, deployment uh, in my vision is that continuous culture and because you have to have a process and everyone have to agree with the process and have to be disciplined to follow the rules that are agreed in, in order to to make this happen, you know? You, if you are not engaged with the process, you, if you're not like uh, really uh, uh, believing that you have to do this step by step in order to have uh, a, a, a really nice feature or uh, delivery, really value things to your clients, you, you cannot do continuous deployment. It's like, in my vision, it's like, um, uh, it's like a culture in us just a process or uh, some uh, tools and things like that. So uh, a, a really good starting point is the continuous deployment in five steps. It was a, uh, an article written by Eric Ries. He is the guy who, read, who wrote the, the book, uh, The Lean Startup. So he posted it. Uh, Days before the presentation, he uh, taught in the web, web 2.0. So he talks uh, a little bit more deeply into the five steps of continuous deployment. So we're going to see these this five steps. But if you uh, want to see or want to know more about this, you can follow this link. So the first step is the continuous integration server. And it's the 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 backbone of the process because it's the central place that uh, you are going to to do the continuous integration. So uh, it's a, a place that you have control in order to run scripts and run uh, and run mechanisms to um, prevent the something like you have to check if everything is okay into, so you're going to run the automated tasks and the continuous integration ser server is the uh, is the tool that uh, enables you to do this so we have all of pl plugins and services or softwares that you can use in order to have a central place that you can control all the workflow in order to deliver this to the client so the second step is the source control commit check. 
it's like uh, you have to to make sure that everything that you're delivering to your client in this way I'm, I'm meaning code uh, the code that you commit in the repository you have to uh, to check this and uh, see it is it's okay it's uh, the have any error or like any problem of implementation or um, any any problem that should be into the production so the next step is simple deployment scripts what is this it's 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 not really like, um, automated scripts uh, be but it uh, it's not mandatory that you can you have to start with this you can start from a script like a move script so the the main thing uh, that is that you have to uh, to uh, have steps that you are going and doing the same thing every time you deliver the code in order to prevent uh, errors so if you have to run the test uh, before it so it one step so uh, you have to run your um, like explanatory tasks, or you have to to pass like um, a static analysis for the code. So we have to make this a script. You can automate it, this also, but you have to to you have to have this these steps, this step by step, in order to make sure that everything is going is going to be okay. The fourth uh, step is real-time alerting. Uh, it means that you have to make uh, tools that pr provide you information about the process uh, in real time. So if a test fails, you have to be aware of this. You have to, to have time to take an action in order to prevent to, to put bugs in the product in your website so the real time alerting is a mechanism that prevent or that make you aware of the problems and take and gives you time in order to to take some reaction about that and the five step the fifth step is the root cause analysis or the five whys what it means it it it's like a technique that the guys from toyota Toyota in Japan, uh, they they use this technique in order to just not, just not to resolve the uh, problem like a, a, a punctual problem, but uh, you you used to uh, ask five times in order to try to find the root cause of this problem. So maybe it could be like uh, my team members doesn't have like uh, the the real um, um, how can I say this? They they are not in understanding the uh, the what the client uh, want. So it's not like just uh, uh, a problem in the code. It's like like an interpretation problem. So the cause, the root cause, uh, normally doesn't is like the bug in the code, but it's like the context that involve this bug. So where to start? Um, the the uh, the main thing is um, is to have a standardized workflow because it's the only way that you have to to make sure that the things are going to be okay. So you have to to make agreements with your team. You have to be uh, have to, you have to have work agreements. And what is work agreements? Who knows this term? Please raise your hands. Okay. So work agreements is like a set of rules that all the, the team agrees and follow. So it's like when you, um, you, can, you cannot uh, start to develop a project. I couldn't find anything or I was too tired and had to go to bed. <laughs> so what was I gonna do? I had this problem and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was stuck in the valley of dearth. When you're a beginner and you're working and contributing to Drupal core, you're on beginner, beginner's hill. Thank you. 
So it's like you can guarantee the quality of the project or the success of the project if you have a team that doesn't agree with some basic rules. So uh, you, you can imagine like um, a developer that has like uh, this, uh, the, his way of developing and he doesn't uh, he doesn't um, like he I, I can do like I can say dirty words so I'm trying to think something that is more soft let me check okay so <laughs> um, he can be like things that are not good for the project so he is trying to like do SSH to the production server or doing something that's not right so you have to make agreements in order to prevent this these things because the only way to guarantee the quality, quality is to, prov uh, to uh, um, implement um, a workflow or pro process that prevent errors. Because errors will, be, will happen. But you have to prevent uh, uh, more and more errors uh, through the process, through the workflow. So an example uh, of a work agreement could be coding standards. So in the Drupal community, we have coding standards. You, you can go in the, in the link and at this slide, and you're going to see like, all the standards that the Drupal community agree in order to uh, develop the project in, the, in a way that everyone can understand the code and can contribute um, at the same way. So it's a, a, a really nice work agreement. Another, another example is everything in code, for example. So uh, we have a problem. I, I think almost all of you know that Drupal stores almost everything in the database. And this is a huge problem when you're developing like for enterprise clients because you have to, to have like environments and all of this, um, this processes that uh, will try to guarantee quality and everything code would be a really nice work agreement in order to prevent like uh, dumping the database from production to your environments every time or doing this stuff like this crazy things so another good work agreement will be test driven development for example we actually do this in Drupal community, writing code for the Drupal code. So you use this in your projects also, writing tests for your features. And it would be a really nice way to prevent uh, errors and guarantee quality for the project. So um, I, I will start with the CI and or CD server. You can make a choice. Uh, I'm not here to to say what the um, the tool you have to use. This one is one of the tools that I know. Actually, at Taller, we use Strider CD. It's a continuous deployment server written in JavaScript uh, in Node.js, and we liked it because we we used to develop uh, JavaScript also, so it's easy to us to evolve the environment and add plugins and etc but you can choose it's your choice there are ones that are like open source there are services there are proprietary but it, it the choice is yours uh, and the, the 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 point is the difference and in between the continuous integration servers continuous deployment servers is the deployment on green. It's like, it's a way of de developing or de delivering things. So in the continuous deployment uh, mindset, you have to have tests, automated tests, and uh, also exploratory tests, and etc. But you have to make sure that everything is passing, so it's green. It's, that's uh, why the, the phrase is deploy on green. So when all the tests pass, uh, is the green one um, because the, the the word that is normally success in, in green. So the deploy on green concept is that uh, you 
uh, should not uh, deliver nothing if the test fails. And you also have to, to make the, the term that you call stop the line. If a test fails, you have to stop the line or the production line in the Toyota way of production, like uh, in the lean process, in order to fix that problem, find the root cause of this problem, and then start developing, because if you doesn't do this, this problem can continue. And it will be worse when it happens again. So I'll talk to you uh, a little bit about our development workflow. It have haven't been we have been um, evolving this. This is not like the final state of the development workflow or like the the best way of developing things. But it, that's the way of uh, we are doing right now, and it's working for us. So uh, I would like to share with you. So we have this um, graphic representing the pipeline. So. It's the process of developing and delivering for the client. We start developing in the development mach machine. We test this in the test or QA environments. We send it to the client in the user acceptance tests environment or the staging environment. And if everything is OK, it goes to production. So the development environment uh, doesn't, uh, it's not mandatory that uh, it resemble the production environment because in some cases you have to to have like a huge topology uh, uh, merging a lot of services and tools that the develop the development process will be like really f uh, slow if you have to have all these things in the development developer environment but it should it should be nice but it's not mandatory the test or QA environment should not be resembled the production also, but would be nice. The UAT and staging environment, or if you prefer the pre-prod environment, this one must resemble the production environment because it's the last the last time the 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 last time you can see something going wrong. So it's like a copy of the production. Environment, so you can run like um, um, performance tests or like um, user uh, tests in order to make sure that the feature that you're developing is the right thing or fits the expectations of the client. So this is the last time to see if everything is okay. So it must resemble the production environment. And of course the production environment is the environment. So recap, um, if you want to see uh, or want to know a little bit more about the workflow or the setup or the requirements of these environments, you can follow these links right at the bottom of the slide. This is a really nice post about um, the development workflow. There are some uh, environments that he advises or he use, but it's not, not like mandatory also. Actually, we are not using all the things that the guy wrote in that post, but it's a, a really starting point. So I really recommend you to, to, to read this article. So what about Drupal? Uh, uh, we are in a Drupal call, so we have to put Drupal in this process. Well. Uh, to, in order to have this uh, development workflow, we have to to uh, have our work agreements. And at all, we are, we are trying to 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 have a standardized development uh, environment or a development virtual machine. And at the uh, Drupal ecosystem, there's a lot of projects that are trying to develop a really nice virtual machine for Drupal development. So there's the um, Drupal work project called virtual machine, like uh, slash VM. There's another one that ZVTech build. There's a virtual machine from the guy that is the Drupal community called Berlin guy. And also, and tomorrow, tomorrow? 
at the sprint, we we are going to uh, continue developing it, Drupal Charm. Is that um, an environment in the Ubuntu Juju ecosystem? You can you if you saw the presentation of Sebastian uh, earlier, he talked a bit a little bit about this. If you doesn't do this, uh, didn't this, or you want to know a little bit more about this, you can reach us at the sprint sessions. We are going to develop or finish developing the Drupal Charm. So I invite you to drop by and um, play with us. Another thing is Drush. You should use Drush because it um, like make your your process faster. You doesn't have to click and point everything if you can use like just uh, one command line in the terminal. So it 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 makes the process really fast, and it, you can automat uh, you can make um, automated things with this. So you can create scripts that use Drush to run something into Drupal or with Drupal. Another thing, install profiles or custom distributions. So who knows what this means? You please can raise your hands. OK, so I, w I will explain it uh, for the others. It's, it's like, um, uh, I don't know if you know Drupal Commerce or Drupal Commons or Open Atrium. All of these uh, software uh, is um, Drupal distribution. So it's like a set of tools packed in a, in a single pack with Drupal inside for doing something specific for um, an industry or like, uh, for example, e-commerce or social networks. So you can use this, this concept to, to start your project. You doesn't have to like download every, every single time you have to download Drupal and have to download views and have to download entity API and everything. So custom distributions um, uh, make, uh, enables you to write like uh, make files. So you can use the drush make command to export the state, the, the actual state of your project if you're already doing something. And it will be like um, an ar archive with all the modules and versions and where they have to be and like the directory and everything. If you have to uh, apply a patch, you can uh, you can put this on the Drush make file. So this is uh, a way to automate um, to automate this thing. So uh, you doesn't have to do every single time you are developing with Drupal. Uh, ins download and install all the modules we're going to have to complete this this project. So another module that I think everyone uh, should know is StrongR module. This module is used to export variables. So um, the uh, the information about the slogan or the site name or this this kind of stuff. There there. There is variables inside the database. So the StrongR module uh, um, is the module uh, that offers you the, a way to export these things. Another one is features. I think everyone uh, like have heard about features. The features module is a module that pack everything. Or like if you have, um, for example, a list of posts and a block in the, at the side, sidebar. You can export these configurations in a single module with, that we call feature, a feature. And this, this will be packed, and you, you can use this in other projects also. And th it, it's, so it's a way to export your configuration and uh, business rules. Uh, into other environments or share this with your colleagues and so on. So it's it's like um, the main uh, module used in enterprise um, uh, development, Drupal development right now. 
we also have the full config module. The, the full config module um, is a module that uh, um, that uh, enables us to export permissions because exporting permissions with features is like hell. It's like hell because permission is something that changes. When you start the project, you have like you can have some permissions that fits with these users, but as the project evolves, it can change, and the feature will make sure that everything stays at this that state. So if you export the permissions with features, you can have problems. So there is a default config module that export and uh, uh, enables you to change the permission, and it, it will just revert the, this configuration or this change. If you actually go to the interface or run the drush command and ask for the revert. So it, it's, it helps us in, in order to export permissions. And also you have custom deployment modules. What is this? It's like uh, a, mod a custom module that you use uh, the hook update. Uh, you can check um, in in, at the link at the bottom of the slide as a, an article, a really good article to, uh, talking about this. So the, uh, the main concept is that everything you're developing, you should use an update function in order to make sure that the, the configuration or the feature that you're developing c could be um, replicated in a build, in another build, a new build. Um, I mean, if you have uh, a Drupal site here and you, you, you're going to have another server, you doesn't go to, you can't, but you should uh, export a database, for example, in order to run like builds in the continuous integration workflow. So the custom development, development deployment module, sorry, uh, use the hook update functions in order to to make the migrations, you know? And also, you can use the configuration manage ma management module that was developed for the configuration management for Drupal, Drupal 8, but it uh, already has a Drupal 7, uh, ver Drupal 7 version. Uh, and it's, it's good because when you're using features, you have to export everything in a single pack. And, and sometimes it's not the, the best uh, way to export these things. So the configuration manage module comes to give you the, uh, the possibility of exporting like single pieces of configurations. And, and this, it will be like, um, like, I don't know how to say this in English and even in Spanish. <laughs> so, well, I'll try to explain. Uh, it, it's like um, if you have to export, um, let's see, um, a view and a content type and that, that stuff, you can use features. So if you have a site that have a news uh, page that lists all the news of the site, you can export this listing and the blocks and everything in features. But if you just want a, a, a single piece of that configuration because the other site has his, li his listing and everything, but has s just a, a, a little bit different. So features uh, will not work as he was designed because it's like a feature um, that it, it's that state, so we you, we should like use features override modules in order to override that feature. Uh, it's a good uh, way to do this, but configuration module may help you in these cases, for example. And also, if you have some exam some better examples, you can tell me. <laughs> we have also the UUID module, so it's used for exporting content. So Actually, right now we are talking about content staging. Before, we are talking about exporting code and not content. So features is used to export content and 
it's not like designed to do this and that's why something can be wrong when you export content with features but when you are doing this you can use UUID module in order to make sure that the content you exported here will be the same because when you exporting something in your, in your development environment you doesn't have like a hundred uh, nodes because you don't have to have this but in the production environment you have all the content so the node 10 in your environment in your development machine is not the same or sh should be not the same as the content uh, 10 in the production uh, environment so the UUID module uh, creates another ID that is unique so you can make sure that this content is the same as the content in the other environment because of the universal unique ID. We have also the deploy module in order to make uh, to do content staging so the problem that this module could, uh, tried uh, to solve it's the dependence of content so if you export like a node that have a taxonomy term related to it the deploy module will try to pack every uh, dependence and deploy this to the other environment it, because uh, you you can you can imagine that I, I think the node is the important thing but there's all of uh, other things like uh, entity relations and taxonomy terms and also maybe other things that I can imagine right now so the deploy modules try to do this uh, packing the dependencies of con of the content you're exporting and deliver everything to the next step or the next environment can be can be used together can yeah it's not it's not like for the same thing you know one is for the uh, exporting code this one is for exporting content so it it can be used in conjunction and we have the WF tools module so it's a set of modules that is like in my vision it's uh, is that is the way that community are, are going to be in the future for exporting content in Drupal it was developed by the Pfizer uh, uh, by Pfizer and a guy uh, also give a session about this in uh, another Drupal call and actually um, it, it uh, focuses on exporting content but it's uh, it's a set of tools so it's it's like um, it has uh, a lot of um, um, tools that um, helps you to export content that deploy module can deploy or uh, it, it's not mature to do this so this one is like more mature in order to content staging so I think this is it's a good um, choice if you are having this kind, of, this kind of problem for exporting content through environments actually right now at Toller we doesn't have this problem so the WF tool is not like our expertise so we, we're trying to to ex studying this and trying to like make uh, situations that it should be the right thing to do so it's like an advice and it, we are not like using it right now using that right now okay. so uh, related to deployment to WF2 module Currently, I'm working on Pfizer on that project. That will be the, the, the new system of the Pfizer to deploy Drupal sites. So currently, this module is not uh, completed. The module the community is not, is not too perfect to, to use. But I think the next, I don't know, three months, that will be a, a new revolutionary way to deploy Drupal sites. So keep it keep posting on that congratulations man so now we start talking about the the code so we have to talk about git so we have to set your git workflow 
in order to everyone works at this, uh, the same and prevent uh, problems. So there are some Git workflows that you can use. I will show the workflow that we use at Taller, but it doesn't mean that that the right workflow. It can fit with your team. So you, if you have not a distributed team or like a really huge team, team um, you doesn't have to have the, the same workflow as us, but it depends on the project, on the team, and everything. So you have the centralized workflow that is like uh, more uh, like the SVN way of developing or versioning things. You have a centralized place that all the code goes there and that the, the master uh, place of the repository and everyone commit to there. You have also the feature branch workflow that you have to make a branch. So use uh, branches in Git in order to develop a feature, a new feature. And when it's finished, you merge back into the, the master branch. So it's a way to prevent the, the, the stable code uh, from the new feature. So we start develop, uh, develop the development of the feature in a separate place. When you finish it and you write the tasks and everything, and everything is OK, you merge back into the master branch. You have the Git flow workflow. And that is like almost the same as the feature branch workflow, but the the difference here is that is like a methodology of de development developing with Git. So the guy who created this this methodology or this workflow uh, has some rules that you must follow in order to to run Git flow, yeah, to to do the Git flow workflow. And actually, we are using the Git flow workflow. And you also have the forking workflow that you guys may um, be aware about the GitHub way of developing things. So you have your project, and you fork the project, develop your version of the project, and you make pull requests. So the maintainer of the original repository will reveal your code. And if it's everything is OK, it will be merged back into the original repository. We, we try to use this. Actually, we were using it in other projects that is not Drupal project. So it's good because you have more people looking at the code because you have to make a pull request. So, so, so someone have to check the code, reveal the code in order to approve this. So it's more secure. But it can be like, um, it's, uh, it's, it can slow down your process if you if you're not uh, if your team is not uh, used to to work in this workflow. So you have to try. So the Git work uh, the Git flow workflow uh, came to us by this article uh, written for Vincent Driessen uh, that was called a successful Git branch module model. So. So here's uh, an explanation of the process. Uh, I will not explain this uh, really deeply because I think it's not the focus of uh, the presentation right now. You can check it out, this links at the bottom of this slide to see a little bit more about this. <coughs> but it's like you have uh, the master branch and you have the feature branch and other brands and to complete the release process. So it's a model to, to work with Git. And it has like a, a plugin. So you can install this, the Git flow plugin. At, uh, you can check it out at GitHub. Or just run app to get install Git flow if you're using like some Ubuntu or something like Debian based well, operating system. So we have to talk a lot, uh, about Git hooks because Git hooks can uh, help us to auto um, automate things uh, in the in the process of development and the development. 
because you have to write your code and have to commit your code and you have to push your code. So every time you are running a git command, you have a hook that can be fired in order to run a process and you can use this for like run the unit tests when the developer push the code for the repository when the the um, uh, the repository um, server receive this code there's a, a hook also so you can like run um, like scheduled um, uh, static analysis stat code, static code analysis in order to prevent um, bad architectures or something like this so you have client side hooks and you have server side hooks the client side hooks uh, is the hooks that uh, are fired in the development developer machine so in the client so one of the hooks that you could use it's the pre-commit hook. So before the commit, you run like linting or um, a, a, a static uh, check for make sure that everything is and the code um, follows the code standards. And you can also run automated tasks like unit tasks or other tasks. You can also use the post checkout hook. This hook is like um, a warning uh, or like a hook for alerts when you start uh, working with uh, too much people and too much uh, features um, and maybe like, uh, let's let's think that the client uh, deprioritized some feature so developing this and it's broken because you stopped at the, the middle of the development so at that state of the code, some tests could be failing. So if you're using the post checkout hook, you can run the tests or the critical task, tests in order to make sure that if you're starting with this uh, state of the code, you already know that are something bad that you have to fix. And it's like um, a way to prevent you to, to keep uh, just with your memory because you can forget things. So this is a nice, a nice hook to uh, run critical tasks uh, against the code. And we have the server-side hooks. The server-side hooks is the hooks that uh, runs when the code came to the server. So we can use the pre-receive hook uh, in order to also make coding standard check, run automated tasks, or make branch preventions and and it's good because when you are trying to use a lean development process you have the stop the line uh, concept so if if everything or uh, any of the tasks failed you can use the pre-receive hook to prevent more code to go to the next step of the workflow so you have to you you have a, a, the ability to prevent the other developers to still pushing code to the repository, even if you doesn't fix the uh, the problem that you should fix right now. So it's a, a really good thing to start doing the stop the line concept in the development workflow. And you have also the post receive hook that you can use to run like load tasks or notifications for your developers. Uh, we at Toller use this like when we push the code, uh, the repository sends us a message in our chat client. So we know that a deployment are going to be uh, started. And we, we see all the tests pacing or failing. So uh, all this kind of stuff could be in a hook, in, in a Git hook. So you can run this, this or your script and you can use this in order to uh, be aware of what's happening behind the scenes so it's uh, it's like a really important thing because if you are uh, it's it's something like if you're driving a car and you doesn't have lights 
you're, you're doesn't uh, have any uh, sense of where you're going. So the alerts is the way that uh, we can use like the lights of the car. It's the only way that we can uh, be aware of what's happening. So it's really, really, really important. So about Drupal related to Git. Uh, there is a coder module. Um, this module um, is it's used to run the coding standard stuff into your code. So it's also um, it's also in a, in the process of development. Uh, the Drupal development, the Drupal project development. So you have um, some um, standards that this module implements in order to run against your code and make sure that everything's uh, it's um, compliant with the coding standard, the Drupal coding standards. You also have the PR PA review script that we are used for um, realm like. Um, pattern preventions or uh, prevent like uh, injections or patterns that are already proved that are wrong. So this one also in, is into the, the Drupal development process. So every time you contribute with a module, you have to use this against your code. So, so if we are already using it in the Drupal project, why we should not use this in our projects? Because it, it uh, guarantees the quality of the code. So you should use this. And you can use this in, into a Git hook. So this is important. And you, ha you also uh, have the Drupal code quality module that actually is just um, a, a, a file uh, um, that it's a hook for Git. So the file just call and command, uh, a drush command, and, and you just download this module, open your repository, and go to the hooks directory into your Git repository, and put these um, scripts into your Git hooks. So it's a, a good way to start if you doesn't have anything. So. Now we're gonna about, uh, talk about automated tasks because that's the part of uh, that guarantees the quality. So uh, I think the automated tasks uh, is the only way that we have security and uh, real, uh, reliability for a continual improvement process. Because if you does if you doesn't have tests to prove that the state of the your project is good right now, uh, uh, you don't, uh, will not be like confident to uh, put more code there because it's it's something like it's it's still working doesn't does doesn't touch this you know uh, you 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 are, you will be like. Um, it will uh, prevent innovation because you can we cannot imagine what will happen or or it's like it's this part of the code is like too complex uh, i'm not touch this let's let's uh let's take this in that way so the tests uh guarantee that you can like factor like do refactoring or refactor your code so uh, it's the the tool we have to guarantee the quality and uh, able us to innovate or uh, make optimizations uh, into your into our code. So a really nice session talking about tests were in the Agile Brazil uh, at the last uh, year, and Joseph Yodo, the guy who created or uh, coined the term of Test-driven develop, development uh, gave uh, a session about tests, and he uh, give, uh, gives us the ten tenets of testing. So, I think we should follow uh, these rules because he has a lot of experience doing tests, and it's like some some like obvious. So, you should. Um, you should see this presentation. Uh, 
Another thing is that he calls the classic test first development uh, or the classic TD and the, the real process. I mean, there are people that uh, actually do TDD by the book, but uh, I think in the, in the Drupal um, context, it's like more difficult because unit tests in Drupal is like uh, slow. So if you're doing uh, units, uh, your, your time, um, like, you you have your the slowdown of your process if you're not like proficient in doing this and also because of your using simple tests for the tool of BDD uh, unit tests sorry. so there's like uh, uh, the workflow that should be used by the book of the TDD and uh, there's the pragmatic testing cycle that fits more uh, with our reality at Taller right now. So we write production code first, and then we write the test for this. It doesn't mean that it's wrong or, or it's right. You, the, the main thing is that you have to have tests. Doesn't matter if you wrote this uh, before or after the production code. So uh, it's like, uh, we are uh, busting some myths about TDD. Okay, so using tests with Drupal, how can we use it? Right now, in Drupal 7, we use simple tests. Simple tests, uh, we're doing well, your job, but it's not like the best solution, I think. And naturally or organically, the community is changing a PHP unit, uh, so Drupal 8 uh, actually using uh, um, replaced the simple tests through PHP unit, so maybe you can use this in your next project using Drupal 8 for unit testing. And you, ha you ha also have the BDD, the Behavior Driven Development, so you have tests for checking for the, the behavior of the user. So in the Drupal community, uh, the most common uh, solution for this is BHAT, uh, it's the BHAT project, project. And we have the BHAT extension module in order to connect Drupal with BHAT. We at Toller, we doesn't use BHAT, we use uh, BRBOR. It's a BDD framework that we built uh, uh, up uh, into the Cucumber project, so it's written in Ruby, not in PHP, but uh, it, it uh, this project create, created the concepts that Behat uses right now. So he has the Gherkin language, that is a language that the managers can understand in order to write the tests in a human language. So you write the test in a human uh, language, and then you write the steps of this test. So we liked the, this approach, and as we saw that Cucumber were more mature, we chose this. But it doesn't mean that this is the um, it's a bulletproof solution. So you can use BHAT if you're uh, more comfortable with PHP or you doesn't like Ruby or something like this. Well, these were uh, the process we're using and the tools we're using. And um, now before the questions, uh, I would be, I, I would share my vision about this. And I think that uh, in the in the in the uh, that uh, the evolution of the Drupal project, we have like uh, some uh, point that like makes us for uh, like like really uh, a really uh, good uh, continuous deployment process because all of the the peculiarities of Drupal, like storing everything in database or or everything. I think in in 
right now with all the changes that Drupal 8 brings to us, I think it will be really, uh, really more easier to do this kind of workflows and implement this process in order to have the continuous deployment running like the right away. So I'm really um, excited about Drupal 8. I think it will help us really, really uh, to um, minimize the, the barriers that we have right now using Drupal 7 uh, in order to deploy uh, the code right to the client. So I think uh, actually right now I'm, I'm like um, really uh, um, excited about the future of the project because I see it's more um, compliant with this mindset, you know? So I start for, uh, I open for questions if you uh, doesn't understand something or you would like sh to share your experience or if you are doing like a better workflow or you have a better process uh, I w uh, it will be really nice if you could share this with us so another um, another announcement is that all the sessions will be a, uh, open for feedback. So if you do like this, uh, this session or if you doesn't like this session, please give your feedback and uh, it will help me to make a better session for the next time. So anyone have a question? I arrived a little late, so excuse me, you said this at the beginning of the session. First than everything, great session, thanks about it. Um, where could I get the slides? So I would invite that the, the name for the slides at the, the presentation on the DrupalCon website. So right uh, when we finish this, the, the slides will be available on the DrupalCon website. Someone else? Okay, so thank you guys. <laughs>